When I see Sydney, I see an incredible movement of people who are being set on fire by the Holy Spirit and are taking the eternal good news about Jesus to every person in the city. I see a small group of people who, even though they represent only 0.2% of the population in Greater Sydney, are confidently moving forward under the leadership of Jesus to make and indeed multiply disciples in this great city. I see a movement of people who are coming to realise that ministry is not the responsibility of just a few professionals, but that everybody has both the responsibility and the joy of sharing the good news of Jesus with their family, friends, work colleagues, classmates and neighbours. When I first came to Australia, uh, I wanted to improve my English. Then I heard from a friend, there are churches out there going to help students with their English for free. And then I was introduced to a, a group of friends that turned out to be Fountain Care Group. Rita, she works as a Bible worker in Fountain. Uh, she was leading that care group as well. So I started to have a little bit of discussion with Rita and she introduced me to Bible study to at and I made the decision I want to be baptized. That lasts like nearly two years and I really, really appreciate her never gave up on me. And uh, I really, really want to first get in closer with Jesus and to be able to have the power to share like what Greta did with me and she was so kind and sharing everything with me, so patient. I, I would like to be the same. Finding people like Rita to love and disciple people like Ruby was a major part of Jesus' ministry here on earth. When I read the story of Jesus in the Bible, one thing really stands out to me, people's compulsion to tell others about him. It happens in Mark chapter 4 verse 20 when Peter and John declared that they couldn't stop telling about what they had seen and heard. It happens with the woman in the well. After her encounter with Jesus, she runs off and she says, come and see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. She wondered, could this be the Christ? After Jesus healed a leper, he told him to quietly present himself to the priest and to avoid spreading the news around, but he couldn't help it. The former leper just had to tell everyone wherever he went. There's something about Jesus that when we encounter him, it compels us to share him with others. Where this really stands out to me is when Jesus is gathering his disciples. One day as he's out walking, he, he walks past John the Baptist and John the Baptist calls out, Behold the Lamb of God. And two of John's disciples decide that they want to follow Jesus. They ask Jesus where he's staying and Jesus invites them, come and see. After that first day, Andrew runs to find his brother and to tell him, we've found the Messiah. Andrew brings Simon, his brother, to meet Jesus. Upon meeting Simon, Jesus says, You are Simon, son of John. From now, you will be called Cephas. The next day, Jesus finds Philip and says, Follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the same city as Andrew and Peter. Just as Andrew had done earlier, Philip went and found Nathanael and said, We have found the one Moses has talked about. Philip repeated those powerful words, Come and see. It might seem a bit haphazard, a bit of a coincidence, but this was Jesus' plan for creating a discipleship movement. People so compelled by his love, so moved by his grace, so overwhelmed by the life change that they experienced that they just couldn't help but tell others about Jesus. Living like this embodies the call of Matthew 28. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
This is our purpose and function as believers, to be people that are so compelled by Jesus' love that we cannot help but invite others to come and see. It is a natural overflow of our experience with Him. And now we invite you to come and see what Jesus is doing here in the Greater Sydney Conference. As I look back over the past five years, the Greatest Sydney Conference has faced a few challenges. We minister in a very diverse city with diverse needs. As a women's ministry director, I know how tough it is to advocate for my ministry while working collaboratively with other ministries. The same goes for the pastors. They can get so busy and caught up with what they're doing at the local church without seeing the big picture. So the question for us has been, how can we work together more collaboratively to reach one purpose and focus? I remember back in 2010, when we launched our new strategic initiative called Growing in Discipleship. It was launched at our Inspire training event. You see, up until that stage, pastors, local churches, ministry leaders here at the conference. We all acted in our own little silos, but with a new sense of vision, with a new sense of mission, discipleship was important. So we figured we had to work together as a group to provide resources for the, for the churches and the, our ministerial team. So we came up with this idea of a church resource team, a CRT, so we meet monthly, and we work together with church pastors. We invite church pastors in and they want to sit down with us and bring us some of the church challenges. We can pray together and work together to try and assist with the local problem. We also meet in regions every month and once a quarter we meet as a city-wide group of ministers and departmental people supporting each other, working together, all for the good of the cause. Disciples making disciples. That has been the focus of our communication to our churches, our ministers' meetings, and the other training events that happen. One, an example of that is our departments working together, pooling their resources and training, and their focus is growing in discipleship. As a conference, we have a clear sense of vision and of God's leading that we need to be growing in discipleship by reaching up, by reaching out, and by reaching across. Have a look at this animation that describes our strategy so very well. As members of God's family, Jesus calls us to be disciples who make disciples. Jesus invites us to tell others about Him and His love. This is our purpose as Seventh-day Adventists in Greater Sydney. This is our calling. This is why we exist. But you might ask, how can I grow in discipleship? It's simple. Love God and love one another. You grow in discipleship as you reach up to God in worship, as you reach out to those around you by sharing your faith and serving them, and as you reach across to members in your church to build and strengthen community. Reaching up is about knowing and experiencing God through worship. The act of worship is a living sacrifice that gives time, talents and treasure. You grow in discipleship by reaching up and making worship a lifestyle that includes Bible study and prayer. You grow in discipleship by reaching out to those around you. Jesus calls us to make disciples. Reach out to people immediately around you in your circle of influence by praying for them, sharing your faith, serving your community and getting involved in mission. Jesus said, Everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. You can reach across and grow in discipleship by creating and belonging to a church where together we can create healthy church communities that reveal God to the world through our love for one another. How can we grow in discipleship? Reach up, reach out, reach across.
We believe that our core role and function as a church, as individual members, is to make disciples in the context of the three angels' messages and to proclaim that Jesus is coming soon. Together, we must continue to focus on fulfilling this great commission that Jesus has given to us. This idea, this concept of growing in discipleship permeates everything we do. A lot of the Adventist schools in Sydney have partnerships with corresponding churches. For example, Wurunga Adventist School and Wurunga Church, Kellyville Church and Hills Adventist College, MacArthur Adventist School and Church in the Fields, and Mountain View Adventist College and Mountain View School. And this is to develop community, um, increase membership and even develop new church plants in the area. And a really good example of this was the last Empire program in 2013 where many of the schools held the programs from their campuses. On the first night in 2013, there were almost 4,000 people attending. As a result of the series, there has been an increase in baptism in the conference. Between April and June 2013, 94 people were baptised in Sydney, compared to 41 in the same period in 2012 and 34 in 2011. And many more people are going through Bible studies as a result of the outreach. It's an amazing story of God's bringing unity into our conference through a shared vision. My name is Joshua Gonzalez. I was raised in Sydney, Australia. I grew up in an evangelical home, uh, went to an evangelical church all my life. But even though I went to church, I, I never knew Jesus. I never had a real relationship with God. And I got older, you know, high school, and I started hanging around the wrong crowds and started getting to rap music. And I started to really stray, you know, from the upbringing that, that my parents had given me. And it was during these, these days, these moments in my life that one of my friends um, called me that he had received a, a pamphlet in his mailbox about some, some seminars that were going on in, in Sydney, at the, in the city. And um, out of curiosity, because I was kind of a conspiracy theorist in those days, I went to check it out. And when I got there, I was kind of blown away by the things that were presented. And I introduced myself to the speaker and found out he was an Adventist, you know, Seventh-day Adventist. And um, he asked me if I wanted to do some Bible studies. And at first, I really didn't want to, but I ended up accepting. So we studied and... I just learned all these amazing truths that I had never learned before in my life. You know, the Sabbath, state of the dead, clean and unclean meats, all these amazing things that I had never learned before. And I started to get to know Jesus as well during those studies. And I was really convicted after the studies that I had to make changes in my life. So I wanted, you know, I decided to leave the gang I was in. I decided to stop the smoking and the drinking and those, those kind of things. It's interesting how I can see back in my life that all along he had this plan for me. but. You know, I, I did a Jonah, you know, I, I, I ran away from it, you know, and I almost lost my life because of it. But even though I had gotten to that point, when I called upon the name of Jesus, He answered me. Working here has had a very positive impact on my life and my faith life as well. To see how our staff care for our residents in very, sometimes in very difficult circumstances, has had a very positive impact on my faith. We do have a, a big impact on the lives of the people that we touch. We touch the people's lives uh, at their most vulnerable, and we believe that uh, that's a time when normal evangelism cannot reach them. We show them what Jesus is like, what Jesus' care would be like, and that just flows through into our motto, which is care with love and dignity. Our recent additions at our Wurunga site is the new administration block and our leisure and lifestyle facilities. Our admin area was spread over a few offices and also over different sites and it was important for us to consolidate them under one roof in one area. So now our accounting staff, human resources and management are all in one area which makes the running of the facilities much more efficient. We've also created some leisure and lifestyle facilities our intention was to create something that the residents can enjoy, but also their families. We don't want the residents to visit in their rooms, we want them to come out. So we created little visiting areas, little lounge areas, like this one, where the families can sit and, and, and chat to their loved ones. What we also try to do is to create something that is very personal and uh, very homely for them. And we've actually included some photographs of the residents wedding uh, days and also just of them um, in general. Where are we going from here? 
We intend to build 20 independent living units on the Arkins Langley site. We also want to renovate the eyes to some of the nursing home, by including some ensuite bathrooms to the existing rooms and bringing that facility up to the standards that's required in an aged care industry today. And after that, we intend to demolish the old nursing home at Kings Langley and replace it with a dementia-specific facility, also with addition of some palliative care beds, respite beds, and also some additional offices. Our schools are mission fields. We have the opportunity to share Christ with our students each and every day. This is an opportunity for our staff, for our teachers, for our students, for our chaplains. 60% of those attending our schools come from non-Christian, non-Adventist homes. So that means that 40% of our students are Adventists. So what an awesome opportunity that creates. And summer camps are a perfect example of this. 40% of the students that come along to summer camps are non-Adventists. They're there because their friends have invited them to be there. So I see our schools as an untapped and incredible opportunity for evangelism. My life really is a testament to the fact that um, the Adventist system, it really nurtures your character. And I know that I wouldn't have wanted to go to any other school because the chapel programs and praying like at the beginning and end of each day and even before meals and the, experience, the spiritual experiences I've had um, over the years, like um, singing in a choir and at Rungak in a school, and every time I hear a worship song that we used to sing, it really resonates with me and I feel really nostalgic. Our, um, the worst programs we had in high school, like experiences like this have really kept me on the right path and I'm so thankful to God that He gave me the experience back in his education. The past five years have brought challenges and blessings to our school system here in Sydney. We've implemented intentional and significant strategies to create vibrant, sustainable, Christ-led Seventh-day Adventist school communities. Overall, our system has grown to be healthy and viable. It is exciting to see over 30% growth in the last three years in our student numbers and seeing Hills Adventist College and MacArthur Adventist College expanding to Year 12. This year we announced that Warunga Adventist School would expand into a high school. This has been a 50 year dream of the school community. The Greater Sydney Conference have recognised the importance of evangelism in our school and they have put finances and resources into projects in every one of our schools. I would like to give thanks to God for leading our system over the last five years. He has blessed us in many ways and all thanks to Him. Each year here in, in Sydney, our schools run an annual fair, a major event, publicity event, but also a celebration event. And so recently the schools have been using our health screening equipment. So they're doing um, BMI, looking at weight, height uh, comparisons, and looking at hydration levels, blood pressure checks, um, looking at health, age. Um, and so these have been very popular with the public and created a lot of interest at the local school level. And another initiative that's been ongoing, we're now in our sixth year, I believe, has been the Biggest Winner Program. And this is really a weight loss competition for our Polynesian churches. And we, and uh, of course, nearly about two thirds of our churches here in Greater Sydney are ethnic churches, and many of those are Polynesian. And so we have a competition every year. And the overall winner gets to fly, return, to their home island. We've opened a brand new community centre down in MacArthur, Macquarie Field. ADRA, our major charity, is partnering with a local conference charity for the poor called Fund for Needy Persons. And so lots of the, the monies that we've been giving out, and that's usually around $50,000 a year here in Sydney, has, has been going to families who are really caught in the poverty trap and they've hit a crisis and they need some help not to create dependency, but to help them to get over that hump so that they can then stand alone and live independently again. We have the opportunity to make impression on young people at very critical times in their lives. We have the chance to offer hope to families. We've been able to be more effective as we've begun to collaborate. In the past few years, we've had the chance to work together with Adventist women on projects like the Bride of War White and Warriors Step Up. And with the education departments, we've been able to work on evangelistic projects that impact the church, schools and youth. 
I um, started going to church in the fields, I feel like when it started. That's where I met Suze, was through my cousin. We attended church together, and she's always been like an older sister and a mentor to me. I think spiritual mentorship is really, really important. Um, it's great to have someone that's older than you that can keep you accountable, um, that can encourage you, tell you the truth. Um, someone that has experienced life, has been through a lot, but can definitely always come back and point you to Jesus. And she has been that for me and inspires me to be that for someone else. When Suzanne joined Church in the Fields over five years ago, it was a fairly new church. It's only just received company status. It was placed there because there was a passion to meet the needs of people in Macquarie Fields. Did you know that research in a number of Adventist conferences around the world has shown that a mission-focused church plant is more efficient at reaching unreached people than a well-established church? Furthermore, research in the Seventh-day Adventist Church has shown that planting a mission-focused daughter church is one of the best initiatives that a church can undertake for evangelism, discipleship, spiritual growth and reclaiming inactive members. When we look at the distribution of Adventist members across Greater Sydney, we notice that there's not many well-established churches along the eastern seaboard in Sydney. God is calling us to enter into this mission field and reach lost people for Him. We praise God for the fact that we've been able to plant 11 churches during the period of 2011 to 2015. Under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, here in Greater Sydney, we're developing plans to plant 10 churches over the next few years with a vision of growing the Seventh-day Adventist discipleship movement in this city. As well as focusing on growing a church planting movement, we have developed a partnership with the Solomon Island Mission, put a special focus on the CHIP program and expanded our ADRA presence into Macquarie Fields as well as Blacktown. These and many other ministries have resulted in steady church growth. We'd love to see more growth, but over the last 10 years, our membership has grown by 12% to 9,296, whilst our attendance has also grown by 12% to be over 7,000 worshippers each Sabbath. With the 11 new congregations established in the last five years, we now have 88 congregations, comprising 65 organised churches, 13 companies and 10 groups. We have also seen significant growth in our school system in the last five years. Despite the challenges, it has grown by 37% to being 2,213 students at the beginning of this year. As Mary Ellen shared, in 2013 and 2014, we launched the Last Empire Evangelistic Series, the first citywide evangelism program in Sydney for over 30 years. It provided outreach to the community, winning many precious souls into the kingdom, as well as creating a great sense of unity and mission within the conference. When I see Sydney, I see a city with potential, a city that is vibrant and dynamic, a city that is rich with cultural diversity. I also see people that need to know Jesus, people that need to know the hope and the meaning and the purpose that comes from experiencing Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Saviour. I see a movement of people who understand that their mission is not just to proclaim a message to people, but to transform uninterested and even spiritually hostile people into avid urban missionaries for Jesus. I see God's end time prophetic movement rising up to fulfill the vision that He has for us. I see a movement of followers of Jesus that continues to grow and multiply until this whole city is filled with the light of Jesus returning in all His grace and glory.